Okay, so welcome to this very special edition of Atheist Republic Discussions. Um, today we have our co-founder, Armin Navabi. We also have our frequent uh, podcast contributor, Rivka, our local ex-Jew. And our very special guest, oh, I'm Susanna. Our very special guest today is San Miguel TV, who is an ex-Black Hebrew Israelite. For those who don't know, Black Hebrew Israelites, I would describe them as a destructive cult and a religious hate group um, known for um, a special brand of Black supremacy and among many other beliefs. So Miguel, thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, I was telling Armin earlier today that I already feel like we need part two because there's so much I want to ask you. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful. So um, to begin, I wanted to ask a little bit about your background, you know, just kind of to set the stage for everyone. Um, where did you grow up? And um, was there any particular faith background that you grew up in? Um, yeah, so I was born in New York City and uh, first generation born in the United States. My um, my race would be uh, Dominican. My, my family's from the Dominican Republic. And um, we were we grew up in Catholicism. I was baptized really young. Um, I did my first communion. And I also did my confirmation as a as a teenager. So I was um, my my life revolved very much around the around church. Even at, even as a, as a young child, I always remember every Sunday we were there at um, as a church in Queens called Our Lady of Sorrows. It's a real famous church. And um, but yeah, it's it's. That, that's pretty much some of my background there. <laughs> cool. So coming from Catholicism, obviously that's like a very dogmatic faith background. I'm an ex-Catholic. I've been through it. <laughs> and so my experience was that once I started to doubt that form of doctrine, I was very ready to just latch on to another form of doctrine, kind of whatever presented itself to me first, right? Yeah. I'm curious... Um, how were you attracted to the Black Hebrew Israelite ideology? So the first, it, it was actually, I heard it through my cousin, who uh, she was three, she's three years younger than me, and she's actually still a part of this group. Um, but what attracted me was, um, it, it gave me some sort of identity. At the time, I was 20 years old. I graduated high school a few years earlier. I didn't go right into college. So I was kind of trying to find my way and trying to real, you know, learn who I was and what I wanted to be. So my, my cousin introduced this to me. And the first thing she told me was that Jesus Christ was black. And did I know that? And um, you always hear that kind of growing up in the environment in the neighborhood I grew up in in Queens. I think I remember watching some comedians like Eddie Griffin or something talk about that and kind of joke about that and say, you know, he had to be black, you know. And, you know, it's it's kind of something that you hear. Um, I grew up listening to hip hop. You, you always heard that in the music, this pro-black and just kind of painting everything black. Um, so when I heard that, it just, it rang truth to me somehow. And that was the introduction into, into, um, the black Hebrew Israelite doctrine. Yeah. So before we really dig in, I think it's important that we set the stage for the rest of the audience to understand, like, what is this movement? What makes it special? Well, I don't know about special, distinct. <laughs> and, um, also, how diverse this actual ideology and movement is. It's not just, there's no one Hebrew Israelites, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. you were specifically in a group called the Israelite Church of God and Jesus Christ, right? 
That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Which they use so many acronyms. So your acronym is ICGJC. And um, so to begin, what would you say are the broad between all the groups? Is there any defining beliefs that all the um, groups seem to hold in common? Yes. So this particular brand of Hebrew Israelism um, that came from Harlem, um, it's, it's really, there's a lot of history to the movement. Um, so we, we can go as far back as, the, as 1920 mm-hmm. um, with the Commandment Keepers, which was started by um, Rabbi Wentworth uh, Matthews. So um, they pretty much taught that um, the blacks in America were descendants of King Solomon through Queen Sheba, and that just just the African Americans and um, West Indians and, and Haitians were descendants of King Solomon. This was in the early 1920s. Um, the commandment keepers um, went through some changes. They pretty much adopted traditional Judaism. Um, they didn't believe in the New Testament at the time and, or, or Jesus Christ. So somewhere between the 60s and the 70s or the 80s, they started um, pretty much moving on to the New Testament and started ado- adopting uh, Christianity and, and some of the beliefs of, of of modern Christianity, except they started teaching that the Hispanics are also part of the nation of Israel, and they created this chart called the 12 Tribes Chart, which is very particular to this this ICGJC group who, at the time, um, well, after the commandment keepers one of the uh, one of the members of the commandment keepers broke off and started the ISUPK. So the ISUPK stands for the Israeli Church of Universal Practical Knowledge, and um, there's another group that uses that name that is not the original group. The original ISUPK is the ICGJC. They just went through some name changes, um, but this group, um, the I, 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 I'm sorry, the ISUPK started in One West, uh, 125th Street. So that's a very famous address. It's the first. I mean, it's the first building west of Fifth Avenue, which kind of splits, you know, Manhattan east to west, um, and 125th Street. You know, that's. The mecca of you know Harlem and and um, you know pro black teachings. There's you have the five percenters there. I mean, there's everything under you know any if, if you're black and you're looking to be spiritual, you're gonna go. You're gonna end up on 125th Street pretty much. So I used to always go there when I was part of the group. But that's some of the history of the group, and that's pretty much what how you know that. Um, if, if you hear them talk about the 12 tribes and um, the Hispanics, Puerto Ricans are the tribe of Ephraim, the blacks are the tribe of Judah, that's how you know that that's one West Hebrew Israelism because there's tons of others. Yeah, so my understanding is there's very specific language that these groups use. So one thing that always comes up is they talk about camps, like this camp and this camp. So a camp is basically a denomination, right? It's a different group. It's a different branch, correct? Correct, yeah. Yeah. And the One West group is always coming up as just like major. Um, And this is kind of interesting. So when I first got interested in the Black Hebrew Israelites, it was um, back in January. Fun fact, I started watching your videos before I was watching Atheist Republic videos. (laughs) <laughs> and really? um yeah and because wow. i met a bunch of these guys downtown if you are in any major city in the united states if you go downtown 
on Saturday, probably, you will find these guys yelling the most <laughs> you have ever heard in your life at the top of their lungs at just about anyone walking by. Wait, sorry, the most, you got cut, the most what things? The most hateful, hateful. thing you have ever well, heard. Well, the reason why I didn't listen to you is because Rivka doesn't meet your mic. <laughs> the most hateful, go ahead, Kika. <laughs> I used the anti-Semitism this early. No, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, one day I was downtown and I saw these guys and I was like, you know, I'm just going to go talk to them. I want to see what's up. And so bad, I started talking bad idea. <laughs> And um, it, I was met with so much suspicion. They thought I was the feds. Um, and I just kept on talking to them. And I started, I framed my questions as if I knew absolutely nothing. And so I was like, oh, well, you guys are, you know, you have these signs and you're sharing your opinions. You know, you seem like you have a lot to say, but I want to understand more of what you guys are talking about. I've never heard what you guys are talking about. Like, do you know something that they don't want me to know? Like that kind of thing. And when I phrased it like that, they became very more interested in talking to me with like sharing their secret knowledge. Um, right. And it was a fascinating experience, especially because um, where I was downtown, there was um, one group across the street, uh, the GMS group, which stands for Great Millstone. And then there is another group like 20 yards away from them, also preaching, preaching. I think it was the practical knowledge group. Right. And... Um, the funniest thing is, is that they both call each other like traitors, right? Right. And they both, neither of them recognize each other as legitimate. Um, and it was an interesting experience because I wanted to talk to someone who I genuinely believed hated me. And they probably did. Um, but they were like, well, don't trust my word. Like, go research what you have to say. Like, when, like, if it's true, go research your, yourself and go see if it's true. And then so I was like, well, out of curiosity, like, let's see if any of these claims are remotely correct. Well, no, they're not. But along the process, I found your channel. And um, it's provided so much information, so much insight. So I highly recommend you guys check out San Miguel TV. And Oh, Rivka. I wanted to say a couple things. You were talking about the history of it. So my initiation into Black Hebrew Israelites was in college because I have a degree in Pan-African Studies, but they didn't seem as mil quite as militant, the ones that I knew. Funky, kind of weird beliefs seemed a little, you know, kind of a mix of some early, you know, Garveyite stuff with some of the 60s, you know, each one teach one and that kind of stuff and just kind of weird stuff. And I'm like, eh, you know, but I've noticed this kind of upward trajectory in terms of their militancy, at least the ones that I've met, particularly in Cleveland. Um, and uh, their um, rhetoric and their... Um, discuss for each other in the sense that they have more of the truth. And I think that you bring that out a lot when you talk in your videos about how cult-like it is. And I think that that's really clear in we're the only ones who have it. No, those guys who call themselves like that, they're not the real us. We're the real us. And I think that that's a really also a good highlight of people who are extremists you know, because a lot of all extremists seem to have this in common. You know, they're the only ones who have the truth. Everybody else is lying. This isolationism, the identity specifically that you were talking about, because it provides that. So I just wanted to bring that up because I find that they are very extremist in a lot of their views. And also really sort of all over the place in terms of the scripture they'll say something and then they'll jump to something else and these two things are somehow supposed to be related 
and you're supposed to just sort of follow along. And if you don't, it's because you don't know and you're not paying attention and you're not in and you're not. So, yeah, it's pretty interesting, you know, the, the trajectory of extremism, at least in my experience. I feel like we're having, we haven't tapped into how black supremacists and anti-Semitic uh, this movement is so Miguel can you actually tell us a little bit more about that well I think a good way to jump into it would be to explain um, Miguel if you could explain kind of the beliefs around the transatlantic slave trade beliefs around stolen birthright how they see the Bible as prophesizing um, oppression that has occurred against black and uh, in indigenous and Hispanic communities in North America. Cause I feel like that directly um, influences their hate. Um, definitely. It definitely does. Um, there, there are plenty of scriptures that you can go to about how much suffering the Israelites went through. So they connect that suffering with their suffering. So, but there are particular scriptures that they misinterpret and just completely uh, just jade the entire meaning of, of the scripture into something that pretty much uh, benefits them. So we go in, we could go into the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. They love that chapter because that's the chapter that pretty much... God get told, you know, God supposedly told Moses that um, these are going to be the consequences, your, your blessings and your curses, pretty much. So the first 15 verses of that chapter are going into the, the blessings. Um, now, that, that chapter has about 68 or 69 verses. So the rest of those from verse 16 talks about the curses. So in the beginning is the blessings and the end is the curses. Now, once you get, so there's a lot in there that they interpret as uh, this happened during the transatlantic slave trade. The, uh, you'll, you're going to have your children taken away from you. That's one of the curses. And we can find that, we can find that in all cultures, really. But they focus in on, on slavery in America. Um, but then when you get to verse 68, there's a scripture that, that mentions um, ships and um, the children of Israel being being um, taken on ships as slaves from one place to another. But at the end of that scripture, it says, no man shall buy you. So nobody was going to purchase you. But so they use the beginning of the scripture and they like to really go into explaining every little thing they'll stop and say this means this so the scripture says the lord shall bring thee into egypt again with ships they say that egypt is spiritually america because supposedly the word egypt means slavery which i found out later on that it doesn't um <laughs> and um so they say that you know it says egypt but it's talking about america and then it says, ye shall be sold to your enemies. By the way, they strictly, they stick to the King James Version of the Bible. I should mention that. Because this verse, this particular verse was mistranslated in the King James Version. If you read the, the ESV, it doesn't say ye shall be sold unto your enemies. It says ye shall offer yourselves for sale. So it was a mistranslation with the past tense, and they, they mistranslated it. But the Hebrew Israelites take that scripture to mean that um, you're going to be sold to your enemies, and no man shall buy you. They take that word buy, and they change that to save. And they say that the word buy really means no man shall save you. And the way that they do that is really tricky. They go into a synonym for the word buy, which is redeem. And they use the word redeem, which has two def definitions, which mean, one means to save and one means to buy. But they say, well, the word buy also means redeem, and the word redeem means save. And that's how they trick everybody up to think that this is a prophecy of the transatlantic slave trade. 
Um, so it's, it's very odd what they do with words and meaning to kind of fit, you know, their ideology. Um, there, there's, a, there's, I mean, the description of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, they take, it says his hair is white like wool. And they change that to mean that, oh, his hair is woolly in texture rather than what the scripture is actually comparing, which is all color. It's not even talking about texture at all. But somehow they go into that scripture and they come out with Jesus Christ had an afro. And it's just it's it's a bit ridiculous when I think about it now. But I remember like really believing this stuff. I was gung ho about it. <laughs> well, so why are they so obsessed in you know, suggesting that Jesus was black and the Bible seems to be about uh, and that the Israelites are they are the black people are the Israelites. Why do you think there that is something that they're so obsessed about? I think the obsession is because those people in the Bible are chosen by God and um, they find a sense of pride, I think, in that doctrine and a sense of belonging and, and meaning, which um, it, it it kind of, it makes them feel special, you know. I, I was I felt really special at the time. I, I felt like I had a, a purpose, and I decided that I was just going to give my life over to this church. And um, it, it's this it's this appeal to secret knowledge that you think you know something that nobody else knows. And and when they taught me how in the scriptures the Catholic Church isn't really following the scriptures. That kind of woke me up and I, I it just made me realize that I, I, I don't know. I didn't know what I thought I knew. So they were showing me something like in the Bible, it says, call no man rabbi, call no man Abba, your father. There's only one father in heaven. But you have the Catholic Church, you have, you know, they, they have the Pope, they have the father. So it, it's like a clear contradiction with the Catholic Church and the scriptures. So. For me, that was something that was very appealing, and um, you, you learn some history trying to um, just trying to learn more uh, about the doctrine. You have to learn more history, and that it was something good that I got from it, but they take that and they just completely just poison it um, with their doctrine and with their hate. But um, I think that's what it is. It's that the scriptures in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, says, Ye are a chosen nation. The nation of Israel is chosen above all people, and they're a better people, and they were just given privileges. And, um, yeah, I think that's the appeal there. Can you explain a little bit about how they interpret the story of Jacob and Esau and how that fuels a lot of... Um, anti-semitism and anti-white racism anti-white racism generally but specifically anti-semitism yes yes so uh, in genesis chapter 25 um you have the birth of jacob and esau um right around verse 24 it starts going into um how this is prophetic right um so the mother um uh it was um who's the mother of jacob and esau was it rebecca mm-hmm I think it was Rebecca. Right, right. It was Rebecca. So, so she was uh, she was pregnant and my name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so she Rebecca was, is my name. Okay. <laughs> right, right. I, I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> I, I literally like I knew these scriptures like the back of my hand. But um yeah, so that's Rebecca. Rebecca and Isaac, that's right. So um I think it was prophetic. An angel came and spoke to her and said, two nations are in your womb. And uh, these two children, they're going to be completely different, completely opposite. And they're going to be both great nations, but they're going to hate each other. So you can look at blacks and whites and, you know, how they're just completely different. And they take they take those scriptures and kind of just it kind of just goes. I mean, if you if you look at it just at face value, it's like I, you can see how they can get confused. But if you really study the scripture, it says that when Esau came out, 
he came out red all over like a hairy garment, um, describing his hair. But they say that that's actually describing Esau's skin. Um, so they say that white people are red, and that's where the term redneck comes from, um, because Esau, his nation were the Edom, the Edomites, Edom. That word actually means red, Adam. It means red when you interpret it, when you go into the actual interpretation. It means red earth. Um, the, the Adam, that's what Adam actually means. It means red earth because he was supposedly made from the earth, from the red earth. Um, yet, you know, they see that, but, <laughs> you know, they say Adam was black. Um, but they, they interpret Adam to mean something else that has nothing to do with red because it's a clear contradiction. But Esau and the Edomites, they are red, and um, there's scriptures that that suggest that, um, well, when you go into the history, the children of Esau, he had a, a son named Amalek. So the Israelites specifically teach that the Amalekites are the Jews. They call them the fake Jews. So they're all Edomites. But one particular tribe that became great out of the Edomites, the Amalekites, are the Jews. And they say the most horrible things about the Jews. And there's a scripture also in Revelation that says that they are the synagogue of Satan or that they are, um, you know, fake Jews that call themselves Jews, but they are not. And they are actually the synagogue of Satan. And they say that those are the white people today that call themselves Jewish so, 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 so the black people are the real Jews, and the the people we call Jews today are the fake Jews. Exactly. That's they the truth. think that who the rest of the world acknowledges as Jewish people yeah. stole yeah. their birthright right. from black. What are? Oh, sorry. And what are the horrible things that they say about the Jews that you mentioned before? And after that, let's go to Rivka. Like you mentioned, they say so many horrible things, but then. Well, they say that. They will, when Jesus Christ comes back on the earth, there's going to be a thousand years of slavery on the earth for all nations. I mean, they, they hate everybody, but they have a special disdain for, for Caucasians, for white people, especially the Jews, because they believe they stole their birthright, Jewish people. So they believe that they're going to have slaves. Um, they believe that they're going to dash their babies against the stones, which is actually a scripture in the book of Psalms. And they also teach that they're going to be raping their women. They, they're OK with with rape as long as it's not one of their own. Um, they teach that they're going to be able to kill their slaves and bring them back to life and keep killing them every day. I mean, it's it's insane. Some of the things that you hear people say, it's, and you know, yeah, and they're looking forward to that. They're looking forward to the day that they could kill white babies by smashing their heads into the wall, and they're looking to forward to the day that they could rape white women mm -hmm. and enslave white people and kill them as many times as they want. They say they, they oh, this is not like a dog whistle or anything. They're openly admitting that this is something they look forward to. They yes. will yell it at you on the street corner. Yeah. The men that I was talking to were describing exactly what they were going to do to me under this situation as I was talking to them. Lovely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Rivka. The, the, oh, oh yeah, go ahead. No, no. So um I'm familiar with that part of the um, ideology, but I'm curious because how is and how do they, um, do the um, Hebrew Israelites, then square the circle with all the Jews who aren't European Jews or who are not Ashkenazi Jews, you know, which is the majority of Jews who live in the country of Israel. And there's, you know, Ethiopian Jews, you know, Beta Israel, some of the oldest Jews on the planet. And then there's, you know, all kinds of brown Jews, you know, people would 
say that they are Misrahi Jews, Sephardim. So I'm just curious because it seems like it's specifically targeted at European Jews, but those other Jews sort of fall into the pot of, you know, with the rest of the Jews. But right. I, it's because I know it's very United States centric because Af black Africans don't fit into this mix either. So I'm just curious as to is there any is any of that ever brought up in the yeah. discussion of Jews of color, Ethiopian Jews, Misrahi oh. Jews? Oh yes, yes. So so I remember them uh, going over the the Ethiopian Jews and, and calling them Falashian Jews and um, saying that because if, if I didn't make this clear, they they don't believe that they're Africans. By the way, they they stay away from um, claiming any African heritage at all. They teach that they're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're, they're Semitic. Um, they're descendants of Shem. So they say that, yes, uh, Ham uh, is the uh, progenitor of the Africans. He was black. And they say, but Shem was also black, and Japheth was also black, and Noah was black. They were all black, <laughs> you know. And then later on, um, I guess through when Esau was born, down the line, this was supposedly the first Caucasian on Earth. And then he spread his seed and mixed in with everybody else. Um, but they don't, as far as Africans, they don't consider them um, their people. They don't consider them their own. They, they hate them just as much as they hate Asians. You know, um, they, they, they speak against everybody. I mean, they have, they even wrote a book. Um, I, I, I forget what it's called. Amazing. It, it didn't, I don't think it ever even got published, but they used to pass it around to the members. And there was a lot of history in there where they will mention the Kaifang Jews, which are Jews in Japan. Um, and they would say, oh, but they are. They are descendants and uh, of the Israelites. So they, they pick and choose who, um, according to the history, who is actually an Israelite by, by, by blood. Um, but they, they'll tell you that the Ethiopians are not Israelites at all, and those are Hamites. That brings me to a really important question. So the GMS members that I was speaking to, um, this was amazing. They told me that it was possible that I was a hidden Israelite because my <laughs> father, my paternal lineage goes back to Scotland. So according to this faction, they told me that Scott and Gale, as in uh, Gaelish, um, Gaelic, um, mm -hmm. actually the Romans, to the Romans, my people were dark and that meant dark or black. So they were telling me that back in the day, I was secretly a black person, basically. <laughs> and because of this and because I have Susanna, it's a biblical name. Um, they were telling me that I was like spiritually an Israelite, right? So this just blew my mind. I went to go look it up later. Scott and Gail does not mean that at all. Um, but that was fascinating because they were telling me, and I'm curious if it was the same for ICJC, ICGJC. Um, so they were telling me that the only thing that matters is paternal lineage. They only cared about paternal lineage. Now, anyone who knows anything about Judaism knows that it's the maternal lineage that matters the most. And so I'm curious if that was the same in your group. And if it was the same, can you explain why they care about the father as opposed to the mother? Right. So yes, that, that's correct. They, they say that they call it the father's seed. So the father determines who you are. So you can't really be a spiritual Israelite, they, they actually speak against that. That would be somebody that converts. Um, to be an Israelite, you can look like yourself. You can look like anyone as long as you can, as long as um, somewhere down the line, which is no way you could even trace this. But um, if your father's 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 father or going all the way back is an Israelite, then you're an Israelite because 
and they'll say stuff like, um, you know, if you plant an orange seed anywhere on the earth, it's always going to yield oranges. So they compare the seed to the man's, you know, semen and the earth out to the woman's womb, pretty much. It's like, and it reminds me of five percent or this is like jail doctrines. This is not like this is not biblical at all. You know, it's 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 just it's very strange. I mean, but GMS is um, they broke off. They're a splinter group of another splinter group that came out of the ISUPK. And um, that that guy that the leader of that group, Tahar is his name. Um, he's addressed me a few times. He's he has said uh, a, the, some of the craziest things they they say as long as uh, a, a a girl has her menstrual cycle that you're you can marry her she can be as young as 10 or 11 or 12 years old she's ready to be married off um so yeah gms they teach almost everything that uh, the icdjc teaches except that uh, icdjc changed the doctrine when they changed their name and now they believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. All the other groups that came out of One West do not teach that doctrine. Hmm. Armin, yeah. you had something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that um, it's, you know, I want to ask you about this obsession with the lineage. Because I, when I was in L.A., uh, the downtown area, I kept on running into them. Uh, and every time I wanted to have a conversation with them, uh, they kept on asking me, like, where I'm from, like, what's my lineage, and like, you know, I didn't want to answer that because I was like, what's the, what the hell, like, I'm, I'm asking you about your beliefs, and they were like, they constantly wanted to know which, what, where I'm born, so that they could have the proper discussion with me based on w w my ethnicity and stuff, um, and then you know they wouldn't answer my questions, and as soon as I finally give them to the answer, they. They started talking to me about my people. Like, hey, can you answer my question? Like, no, let me tell you about what's going what's going to happen to you when we're finally victorious. And then, um, but what is it like? That, like, it doesn't. It's so bizarre because they're so passionate and they're so certain that they're right about everything. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, and it's just so weird to me that how so many people can be convinced that people deserve to be, you know. Um, get, if, either give be given everything to them to rule over the world, or be raped or killed based on their lineage. Like, I mean, I've dealt with uh, a lot of people that seemed crazy to me, but even they could see how unfair that is. I don't understand how so many people could be convinced that you're deserving of punishment or reward based on your lineage. Do we have any? Yeah. Yeah, I mean <clears throat> they they always want to know what's your background so they can properly address you because their entire worldview is is just based on race. Everything is color coded. So but but then if you if you seem a little bit interested like Susanna was 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 trying to show they start saying, well, you know what, maybe she's, um, you know, maybe she's an Israelite. So it, it's not really always determined uh, by your, your ethnicity. It's determined by if you want to believe them or not. But if you don't believe them, then they'll say, well, yeah, then she's, he's definitely that. And she's definitely not this just because you don't believe. But yet they do teach that there's going to be unbelievers of their own. So. The entire doctrine is just a mess. The The way that they interpret or the way that they understand genetics, it's just they, they don't understand it. It's now, based on, it's like kindergarten <laughs> knowledge. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're comp they, when they said like, Susanna must have been very nice because uh, their way of complimenting somebody is telling somebody that is as white as snow like Susanna that hey maybe maybe you're black 
is their way of saying like, hey, we like you, <laughs> right? It was so <laughs> weird to have like a group of like seven grown ass black men tell me that I was like secretly black. I was like, what is happening? <laughs> they wouldn't. No, it's so but, true. They wouldn't talk to me until I told them my name, which they identified as biblical, and they found out that I was Scots Irish. Then they were like, "Oh, you're not a Fed." <laughs> so, so wait, so but how were you convinced that this is okay, Miguel? Like, because you might have some insider knowledge. Like, how could anybody? Like, sometimes when I say, like, I, I was very religious Muslim at some point, right? Some people ask me, like, how could you believe in any of that? That's, so I want to know how could you, like, how what convinced you? Well, it was. It took a lot. It took months for me to come in and actually um, sit down in the classroom because, well, really at the time in, in Orlando where, because I, I had just recently moved to Orlando from New York City when I first heard this. Orlando wasn't big. I'm actually one of the pioneers of the, of, of the cult in Orlando. I helped start that, that, um, that faction. So um, I think... I mean, uh, there was, the, I think a lot of it has to do with the culture I grew up in. Even though a, a lot of my, my best friends, even till, till this day, who I grew up with are Greek. Um, I grew up in a Greek part of, of, of uh, New York City. So I grew up, it, it's an old Greek town called Astoria. And um, it's, I mean, in the 90s, it started becoming more diverse. Um, there were Puerto Ricans, there were Haitians. I mean, I have friends of all ethnic backgrounds. So I remember at the time, maybe a few years before then, I was listening to uh, a group uh, called Dead Prez. They're a very militant, anti-white, anti-government hip-hop group. Um, and they would say certain things. I would hear it in music, and it's like they love living in history. They live in black and white. They live in times before the civil rights. They love uh, looking into things that are just going to anger them. It's, it's, and that's what I was constantly being shown while I was coming in. I remember when they first told me that white people are the devil. And that didn't sit right with me. I wasn't raised like that. So it didn't sit right with me initially. Um, as I started reading scriptures and constantly being around my cousin who was just I mean, all about this this cult at the time. She was always showing me things in the scriptures and how, you know, this is um, the, the white man is ruling the world. And this is exactly how the Bible predicted that Satan was going to rule the world and that we're going to come afterwards. So it was a lot of conditioning. It was a lot of just um, being being shown all the mistreatment and, you know, going back to the history of America of black men. And even, you know, with the Hispanics um, and what was done in, in the island of Hispaniola in South America and Mexico, they go into all of that. And, and then, oh, and the Native Americans are also part of the 12 tribes group. So just any, any minority that has faced, like, oppression here in the, in the west side of the world is considered an Israelite, it seems like. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Well, this brings me kind of back into your story. So, one, I'm curious to know what of the 12 tribes were you assigned? And then I have the understanding that each of the 12 tribes kind of has their own role or their kind of own job sometimes. And then also, what was your initiation into the group like? Okay, so I would be considered a, a Simeonite. So oh, the, Rivka, do you have the chart up on your phone right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. the go. famous chart. Right. Oh, you're muted. As soon as you said Dominican, I was like, ah, but <laughs> Haitians and Dominicans are on the same island. So why do they have to be two different tribes? That didn't make sense to me either. And right. it was one group of people. Right. That right. I was like, well, why are they? Hey, whatever. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Right. So, well, that's actually interesting there. Um, my, my wife is Haitian. Um, and um, there's a scripture that talks about Levi and Simeon. So the, the Haitians would be the tribe of Levi, who were the priests. 
Um, and so Levi and Simeon were brothers that went into, <laughs> I forget how the story goes. They, they Basically, their sister was raped, and they went into the town where, where the men raped them and killed everybody in the town. And in the curse of Levi and Simeon, it says that they shall be together, but they shall not be together. So it, it's like the way that you that they interpret those uh, tribes to be who they are today. It's like they find the most the little bit of truth and just they just run with that. Yeah. So just to add really quick, the story of Levi and the. It was Dinah, right? And she Dinah, yeah. was supposedly raped, but she also wanted to marry, you know, the prince. Mm -hmm. He wanted to marry her. And they talked uh, Jacob and Levi was the guy behind this, talked Jacob into having them all circumcised. Because how could Dinah marry uncircumcised men? And mm -hmm. while they were all recovering from the circumcision is when Levi, who is the leader of all of this, convinces the brothers to go in there and kill them all. So I just want to add that little <laughs> awfulness. Right. And when I was growing up, Levites were known to be, oh, you keep Levites, you know how they are, you know, they'll, they'll get you, you know. Right. Like. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they, they, they say that the Haitians are the tribe of Levi and, um, you know, they say that they're cursed more than any other tribe because they were the priests. So that's why they say that's that, that, that that's their explanation for why the country of Haiti is in the condition that they are in. They say that's because they were the tribe of Levi. They are the tribe of Levi and they didn't uphold the law the way that they were supposed to. So there's a lot of connections that they make. Um, but. You know, if you know anything about history and genial and you know genetics and just everything, just flies right in the face of this doctrine. I mean, they they consider Native Americans black, which they're just not. They consider, I mean, you can be, you know, you you have Cubans and Dominicans that are very very Caucasian, um, and they are they can still be allowed into the group, and they're considered one of them. So it's just very odd. It seems like they're just, um, they see that there's a culture among all of us that we kind of, uh, we're kind of similar, you know, in a way, but we're really not, you know. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, Susanna. <laughs> Armin, I see you have a question. Yeah, I mean, uh, how popular, I know this is a fringe group, but they are more, more popular than the seem that they should be <laughs> given how crazy their ideas are well funny that we should have Miguel so who, on right now because yeah. Nick Cannon is in a bit of trouble right now uh, for yeah. I don't know I still need to go watch the full interview he did with Professor Griff but um, yeah. it's a whole mess that I won't fully describe here but a lot of what they were talking about falls into a similar realm of Hebrew Israelite stuff they were talking about how it's impossible for them to be anti-semitic because they're the real Semites a tapping into that idea of stolen birthright again, that stolen birthright conspiracy, and there was a lot of other stuff. And then people are jumping on the bandwagon defending him. Mm. It's it's a mess. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but but can I get an answer to my question regarding how popular they are? Sure. And then we can get into that later. Yeah. 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 Sure. So I I came in when in two thousand four, and. The ICGJC at that time was probably one of the more popular groups because the the man who actually created that 12 tribe sign is still in the ICGJC. He never left. His name is Arya. They call him Apostle Arya. He is, um, I mean, he's been doing this since, since a child um, when they were still keeping the old Judaistic beliefs. And he was actually bar misfit into this um into this 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 cult before it turned into what it turned into because i, b I believe that it got in i mean we i know that it got infiltrated and there was definitely more mind control uh, imposed but i mean the popularity of it i i've 
I um I actually the boys to men were were a part of the group that I was a part of. You know, the R and B group Boys to Men. They actually came and I met two it was just two of them that were a part of the group, Wanye Morris and, and Sean Stockman. So they're from Philadelphia. Philadelphia's full of black Hebrew Israelites. And they um they joined that group. They're not part of it any longer, but they yeah, it's it was I think it's just um I, I really don't know what, what to tell you or why it be, why is it so popular? It's it's just it just even till this day, now that I'm awake and I I remember how I used to believe it's just it's it's just very easy to, to debunk many things that they teach. They teach King James was black. You know, that's why they they were saying, you know, because he was Scottish. So. Shakespeare. Right. Shakespeare's black. So it's like I said, it's this sense of just pride, black mm -hmm. pride. You know, this is something that's just being pushed. And it's like I look at it like a, as a precursor to this BLM movement now that uses a lot of the same um they use a lot of the same the same sayings that I've heard in the call. I hear some people now with BLM say the same things. It's it's very odd what's going on. I mean, I I, I I I'm forced to believe like this is some type of mind control that's going on. It's just like a social experiment that's happening in the world. That's what it seems like. I don't like to get too conspiratorial. We're getting real <laughs> spicy. Wait, um, what's what's the similarities? What is what's what do you what do you mean by the BLM movement? What are what are the similarities that you're noticing? Well, there, if, if if you know Steve Hassan and the bite model that he created for cults, so you have bite stands for behavior control, right? Information control, thought control, and emotional control. So those are the four key elements of a cult. Um, the ICGJC hit on all of those. Um, I was thinking about, I've been thinking about this a lot with BLM, BLM and they, they control your behavior. Well, well, yeah, they tell you to protest, they control your behavior. You go out there, you're angry. Um, they tell, they kind of tell you what to do. Not so much like the ICGJC, the way the ICGJC used to control your, your behavior was they tell you not to have sex on the Sabbath. They tell you, um, Sometimes they, they, they have courtships. You can't just marry anybody. You have to give, be given the approval. Um, so BLM is not so much like that. But there's a lot of um, information control because a lot of the media is just, they're just not giving full, a lot of these full stories when it comes to the shootings. And, and they were responsible for promoting a lot of those lies with Mike Brown with the hands up, don't shoot. So that's false information. That's disinformation. That's what a cult does. Um, T would be the thought control. So thought control. I mean, I, I, I'm i definitely going to do a video on this because there's a lot of similarities. We should have you back on after you do that video yeah. to just talk about what your views on BLM is because that's a, that's a whole other conversation that we need to. We, yeah, that's okay. Norman, great. You need to go watch his videos about BLM. Okay, okay, I will. I have a couple questions. These are just simple. So I was listening to a lot of, I listened to your videos, but then I went and listened to some specific videos from like Great Millstone and um, the um, ICGJC. I can never keep them straight. And then I was, you know, listening to some old stuff from One West and then these other things that people that I run into on the um, Pan-African Studies group that I'm from my university, which this is turning up more and more and more in. Right. Um, and I had just a couple questions. So there's Hebrew in there, but some of it seems like, you know, the pronunciation, but some of it seems made up. And I'm curious do they make up some of the hebrew or is it you know i'm just wondering like it, it almost appears like they're using their own language at times that only the members can understand and um i was wondering about that and then the other thing is when i was listening to those videos you were talking about how 
they had answers to these questions. And I felt like part of what even started happening to me is it was so long and what they were calling the breakdowns Mm -hmm. and they were just anything somebody would ask, they somehow could find an answer to it, whether it made sense to the other thing. And they kept saying, Oh, you know, we're skipping around a lot. Well, that's because, and so it almost becomes like, wow, everything I want to know, they've got an answer to. And it's also fatiguing. So you get to the point where you're almost like in a, group trance like state because they went on for hours and hours when I was watching some of them I actually had to skip through so I'm just curious as to your take on that and I am curious about the 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 language in particular well yes the the language is definitely made up they um see we had a Hebrew academy that we would hold on Sundays and in Orlando, I used to teach like four out of the five classes. Um, so there was, um, they have 22, I believe it's 22 characters in the Hebrew alphabet. They pronounce everything with ah. So the first letter would be ah, and then there's ba, ka, ta, la, ma, na, sa, ai, pa. Well, I would be the only one that's not pronounced with an ah, with an ah. And taza, kwa, ra, sha, sa. So every character is pronounced that way. They, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not good with the language and how do you actually read it. But I know that what they're doing is not the language. They, it's definitely made up. It's part of their group. Um, and they actually wrote a manual out and, and, you know, interpreted certain words. And it's. It's all made up, though. There's no history behind that. What, what was the other question? I'm sorry. I don't even remember now. Um, oh, I was talking about the breakdowns. Oh, right, And these right. long, long, long study sessions that almost had sort of a, like fatiguing, almost trance. Like because I was listening to them and listening to them, and I even found myself, I started tuning it out and getting into this because I just couldn't keep up with it because they were skipping and at one point he even said he was talking to somebody else well you notice I'm skipping around a lot see you see you might think that this doesn't you know have a purpose but actually and then he would you know so it it almost had this sort of circular language to it that anything anybody would say he would find something whether it was over here or over here over here that somehow related to it so I was just yeah. wondering if you had, you know, with this breakdown sessions, they went on for hours. That's some like of them. a law. This is like a law for them. There's a scripture in Isaiah chapter 28, I believe. And it says that um, it says something to the effect of here a little and there a little. And that this is how you you this is how you work around the Bible or something. I forget exactly how it was worded, but they yeah, they jump around and it's like. You feel like, man, you do you, do you have ADHD or something? Because it's like you can't have them. They can't focus on one scripture and then just break that down. What they'll do is find a word in one scripture. And if they can find another scripture that has that word, they make a connection right away, even if it's not related at all. So it's just a very um, unscholarly way of, of interpreting and reading the Bible. But what I found interesting, though, is I was watching the participants because they were filming a lot of these meetings. And it almost seemed like it was this real desire, like you were saying about identity, to be able to understand it. And even if they didn't, then that was part of it. Like, well, I'm, there must be something wrong with me that I'm not getting this. And so I need to keep listening and keep coming back so I can see. Because it kind of seemed that there was this real desire to be in on whatever that knowledge is. Right, right. That's a, that's something that attracted I mean, that, me, but was the passion. The passion that they have behind the beliefs was really attractive. Um, when I would watch uh, Malcolm X and, and the way that he spoke was very passionate. And it's like, you just, you just believe him, just the way that he speaks. And there's a lot of that um, with, with the leaders. They're, they're, they're usually very charismatic. 
the leader of, of the cult that I was a part of was, was very charismatic and he just had a way of, of keeping you listening. And, and um, they had other ways to, to mesmerize you and put you in a trance. We, we would do chants in, um, in, the, in the classes we would do chants. We would. There was something called the seven prayers that we would do every Saturday, and we would chant seven prayers that would take forty minutes. And this this was part of the mind control. I mean, we would. You would feel. I I, I used to attribute that to the Holy Spirit, but you know, it's just your mind. It's. I, I don't know exactly the science behind it. I know I've read about it, but. That, that's something that they do purposely. There's definitely a lot of in, implementing of cult tactics to keep people in a certain state. Everything yeah. that Rivka and Miguel is describing are explicitly part of ind indoctrination techniques. Sure. It's cla classic indoctrination techniques, keeping you tired, moving from topic to topic to keep you disoriented and confused and also trying to understand more. And um, the chanting is totally on par with um, trying to indoctrinate people because it um, is a way to build a sense of belongingness with other people. It actually triggers a lot of dopamine in us. So that's part of why like singing and music is often a cult indoctrination technique. And also um, in my own experience, why I've become a little bit um, skeptical about certain forms of protest. Um, but I wanted to get back to your initiation because there's so much about the actual structure and internal life of this cult that I find so interesting. So I know there's a heavy tithe. Um, I believe you had to do Hebrew Academy. So can you talk about how Hebrew Academy, I think that's what you called it, and um, how controlling of an environment that was? Sure. So... So my, the Hebrew Academy wasn't introduced to the city of Orlando until a year and a half after I joined. Um, so before that, the way that they keep you uh, busy is by having classes four or three to, three to four times a week. So we would have it Thursday night, Friday night all day Saturday because it's a Sabbath. Um, so um, up until the sun goes down and then after the sundown on, on after sundown on Saturday, we would even go out and hand out flyers. So there was a lot of time consumption. And then on Sundays was the Hebrew Academy that was introduced later on. And they had sent down some, some uh, men that had already had years that had high, that had rank. There's also a ranking structure, um, and they sent them down and initiated us into the Hebrew Academy. Now, we had to to be a part of the Hebrew Academy. You have to pay extra on top of your 20 percent tithes that we were already paying. Um, you have to pay. I think it was 21 dollars a week if you joined the academy. You had to wear all black. You have to wear BDUs, uh, army pants, um, army boots, and we would do marches. We would we would do um, we would literally march down different streets. We we did this in different cities all throughout Florida. I mean, the churches they do this everywhere. Um, but this was so so the Hebrew Academy would teach would be every Sunday. So once that was implemented, that's when there was more order. You started, they started giving out ranks in, within the city of Orlando. So now we started feeling even more special now because we had, we were given a gift. Um, it was like a reward. And we, uh, we were able to, to manipulate others now or, um, you know, kind of wield our power and it, it, it was kind of like, I remember the feeling when I got that rank. I, I felt really good. I thought it was really something. Um, it, it took me a year. Well, you graduate the Hebrew Academy in a year. It takes a whole year. If you, you know, every Sunday for seven hours or six hours, you're learning Hebrew. They're fake Hebrew. You're learning the history of the Bible. You're learning their breakdowns, which is 
their explanation, like a, like a breakdown would be the color of Christ, right? They'll have a breakdown in what scriptures and, you know, so, um, yeah, it was, it took like the first few months, I was very iffy. Uh, I had family telling me, you know, everybody was coming up against me and they would bring scriptures to tell you that that's what's supposed to happen. People are supposed to come up against you. So you're on the right track. So, you know, it was a lot of that going on. And they just people were just pushing me to, to stay in there, hold on. And even if you feel like there's something wrong, that's Satan telling you that there's something wrong. Those are not your thoughts. So that played a big part in me doubting myself and just kind of going along with whatever they, they were saying. Oh, go ahead, Armin. Uh, what are what are your views on God and religion now? So I I really I don't I don't believe that there's a God. I haven't. I mean, I consider myself an atheist for sure. I have considered myself an atheist for the last five years. Um, agnostic atheist, I guess. I, I don't. I'm definitely an atheist. Um, and religion. I just look at it as, as divisive, just like politics. It's very divisive. And, I mean, I guess if, you know, it depends how extreme it is, I'll say. Yeah. Rivko? I was just curious, since we were talking about your particular story, and you were saying your family, you know, was you know, having some, was questioning you about this. That's what I was curious about, actually, in the beginning. You know, how did your family feel? Is your family themselves quite religious within Catholicism? You know, was, I'm assuming that um, the um, Hebrew Israelites were somehow, you know, kind of telling you to leave your family there yeah. because they're your new family now. But I also know that you had a cousin who was, involved in the and still is to my yeah. knowledge correct so yeah. i'm just kind of curious you know so you had one side of the family who was in the church and then the other side who was kind of telling you no this isn't and i'm just curious as to the, the side of the family that was not happy with this are they themselves really very religious catholics or you know what how were they respond what, what kind of things were they saying to you and then what did they say when you got out I'm just a little bit curious about your family how they responded to it right so when i first joined i was i was very very excited i thought i just found like the greatest thing on earth <coughs> excuse me so i started i just spoke to everybody about it i thought people were going to be more receptive i didn't know that i was going to be met with such um, animosity and just um, but it, I have family who are atheists. I have an uncle who's been an atheist for I don't know I don't know how long, and her um, his sister is also an atheist. So they were the main ones that were really just coming at me saying, you know, this this is not right. You know, <laughs> this is just not right. But their mother is extremely religious. She's the most religious person in the entire family. She actually speaks at the church. Um, where I was baptized at, she still speaks there every Sunday, every Saturday, and I love her. She's an amazing woman. She's great. She's one of the greatest cooks. She's just, everything she does is awesome. Um, but she's just very crazy for Catholicism, you know. Um, she never really told me much. She never came at me as hard as the atheists, you know, came at me, my, my atheist family. Um they, um, yeah, they were the ones that were pretty much like, you know, this ain't, this ain't right. My friends, I didn't even want to tell my white friends. I, I didn't mention it at all. I'm like, I'm not even going to go there. Um, we stayed friends even while I was in, in the cult. And we were we would still hang out sometimes. I would never even bring it up. I didn't want to destroy that friendship. But with, um, with, with my family, who were, you know, who were Hispanic, of course, I thought that they were chosen. So... I would definitely, I definitely felt like it was my job to bring them in because I thought that I, that's what I was chosen for, to bring others in. Um, but yeah, my, my cousin, my younger cousin, she was, she heard it maybe months before I started being uh, taught by her. She was the main one teaching me. 
and um, she's still very, very much involved. She's like she was like a spy for this um, the cult leader of this group. Um, she's very she was like very into it. Anything that you know, the women couldn't teach. They couldn't become a teacher. They couldn't get that rank to become a teacher. But they they were they started to be given rank later on as the church progressed a little bit and women were called uh, there's a group uh, or I forget what they called the holy women I think is what they call them so they initiate women now to become holy women but they really don't have any power within the church um, they could they can now make suggestions is what it is but they can't teach um, the man is the head of the woman. You know, they're they're just really there to bear children and, you know, and you can't use contraceptives, you know, that's forbidden. So my cousin has like seven children. I, I can't even keep up anymore. Every year she gets pregnant and just it's just back to back. Um, but she has cut me off because I'm, you know, I'm excommunicated. So she's still a part of it. And, and if you're a part of the church and you leave. It's even worse than somebody who's never joined. So um, that's how she looks at me. But the rest of the family is they, they when they found out I left, they were really happy. But the religious ones were trying to get me back into the church. And I was like, I'm not I, I mean, I went back. I went back to I, I'll still go to church with them if they invite me. You know, I, I won't do it as much. But if they really want me to come, I'll do it just to not upset them. But. Uh, there's no way that, that I'm going to be convinced of any of that stuff. And it's not really just because of the experience that I went through. It's it's after I experienced what I experienced, I that made me want to study more critical thinking. And that's that's what really made me an atheist. It wasn't the fact that I went through such a you know bad experience. That's what everybody assumes. And it's like it wasn't even really that bad. You know, they weren't they weren't telling us to drink poison. It wasn't that bad. We didn't have to castrate each other. It wasn't that type of cult, you know. <laughs> um, but it was still pretty bad. They took a lot of our money and time, and and uh, I just took it as a as a learning experience. Is what I did. That's very interesting because uh, a lot of Muslims tell me that I left Islam because I must have had a bad experience. Right. And uh, I'm always like, no, I didn't have a bad experience. It was great. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, when I was when I was becoming an atheist, I didn't want to become an atheist. I was forced mm -hmm. to become an atheist because that's where the logic was leading me to. Like it's it wasn't something I would have when I was becoming an atheist. I would have at that point I would have rather that I was like it was wrong. I wanted to be proven wrong. I wanted to remain a Muslim. But right. with regard, I wanted I wanted to ask you about the. Uh, Atheists in your family, you mentioned. Uh, yeah. d uh, do you think that what they did was a positive thing, like with them trying to attack your beliefs and trying to change your mind? Did it have a good influence or bad influence, or what are you like? What are your thoughts on that? So at at first, it was it was um, it was it's, with, with one particularly. Um, my aunt i know she's an atheist but she's very liberal and and she just like she doesn't really speak against religion she's that type of atheist you know like she loves all religions and she thinks it's all beautiful and then it's all great um so she was the one that was really coming at me and and like she she was supposed to marry someone at the time i remember this just like yesterday who was from syria and her, his family forbid him, forbade him from marrying her. So she was, she like really went through some of the same, you know, cult type of stuff. But um, at, at the time I looked at it like, you know, I can't even talk to her about it. She's just going to come up against me. I tried to go into the Bible with her. She wasn't trying to hear anything. And um, my uncle, who's an atheist, he didn't really attacked me at all he just told me a few things that always stuck with me and it was always in the back of my mind even throughout the seven years that i was in the cult it was just it stuck there certain things would come up and and he would just tell me you know um just to pay attention when they're manipulating you when they're trying to use you 
because, you know, that's what they love to do. So I was always aware of when I was being used. And, um, yeah, it was just, it started bothering me. So after just six or seven years, I, I couldn't take it anymore because that's all it was. It was just a bunch of manipulation and you couldn't think for yourself at all. So it wasn't one particular incident. It was just the totality of the whole thing right. that made you decide to leave. There yeah, it was. It was. It was like just over the years, I kind of mm -hmm. got tired of it. I remember how I was that first few years. I was very passionate about it. I wanted to go out and hand out flyers um, when when they weren't telling us because they didn't. We didn't have. We didn't really have a schedule on when to go hand out flyers. It was kind of like, yeah, you just, we're going to do it today. And we, and we all got together as a group and we didn't have like a leader over us at the time when I came in, but after they got that, the leadership in the Hebrew Academy uh, was brought down to Orlando, then it started becoming more oppressive. And that's when, that's when I started backing off and I found myself not answering their phone calls or making up excuses for why I can't come around and do this, you know, what I what I used to love to do in the past, what I used to want to do without anybody pushing me. Once they started pushing me more towards it, I started backing off. So to that point, you know, you're saying your experience wasn't that bad, but listening to a lot of your videos, like a lot of the internal culture seemed pretty extreme. So can you please describe the system of punishment that was part of the internal culture like the point system and the lion's den right right yes so yeah i mean i, I don't want to make light of it because it, it was horrible um you know i'm comparing it to other cults but you know I, i'm trying to look at the best you know the, the light side of it um so the lion's den i'll start with that that was something that goes back to the 90s the 80s back um when um, the ISUPK was around, they had their academy. They they would punish the men that were unruly, that broke, that that would maybe wouldn't pay their tithes or just didn't listen to any orders, or didn't complete a project on time. They messed up with anything, or you know, or if they went to council because this is something that they use against you, the, the secrets that you know about your marriage and your your life. They use that against you, so you can get Lion's Den uh, for that. So Lion's Den is a rigorous um, workout, pretty much. So during the academy, the, the, in the beginning, in the, in the morning, um, the first hour, the first class would be like a workout slash marching, you know, military, whatever. Um, so during the hour when we would work out, we would get breaks. We'll do 10 push-ups, and it'll be... We'll have breaks in between. The people that are in lines then are just straight doing push-ups, like without stop, without ceasing, um, frog leaps, um, you know, any rigorous workout that you can think of. We uh, we would have uh, the unruly uh, members do that. The men only, not the women. Um, so whoever was in the ranking system, you couldn't be what they call a citizen if you didn't join the Hebrew Academy. They, they, they didn't give you lines then. They didn't have that power. Um, so there were a lot of people that would just remain citizens because they didn't want to join the, lion, um, the Hebrew Academy. They didn't want to be a part of that system. But uh, so the lions then would really just, I mean, I, I remember one um, individual that already had back problems and he was constantly being given lions then because he, he was lying. He was. He would also. He would always lie about where he was because he didn't want to be a part of. Like he wanted to to be a part of the beliefs. He wanted to preach everything, but he didn't want to do the hard work. So we would always, you know, pick on him, and we would always say like, "Oh, look, don't don't be like this guy because he's not a true believer." You know, he just said he's just like a. We used to call him a a holiday Israelite. Like they would come around on the high holy days. You know. So we, those men that would join the academy and they would still just be, you know, not following orders, they would get put in lion's den. And it could, it could be, you could get lion's den for four weeks. So every Sunday, 
for one hour for four weeks straight, you would just be destroyed physically. Um, so that the point system was uh, another way to to oppress you, um, just like lions. Then, but this one hits you in your pockets. So if you if you got two thousand points, you have to pay two hundred dollars. You have to pay ten percent of however many points you get. Um, so you could be given points by any of your superiors, and you could be given points by the the cult leader himself, which would do that. And um, I've seen uh, where members would get 10,000 points, you know, for, for doing something, for dropping the ball, you know, on a high holy day. For not, not, um, and, and the cult leader was, I mean, this guy was a narcissistic sociopath. So you could never please him. He was constantly screaming on people, bullying them, and giving out points. So yeah, you you were it was just oppression on on many levels. So yeah, they should one of them should one of your cult leaders should come out and say like ten points from Gryffindor or something like that. Like, yes. <laughs> don't you it's know like, that's pagan shit? <laughs> no, but it says so much like Hogwarts. I mean, the opposite, the other way around. But yeah, yeah, it's the worst version. Well, it's actually yeah. So. I know um, some of that is specific to the ICJGJC, um, and I know that all the other groups don't have that um, same system. But so I know that the ranks are very stratified, though. So what is so Tazadakia, the mm -hmm. cult leader? He well, he made up his own fancy title, the Comforter, but. Right. Um, Underneath him, there are all these ranks. So can you describe the ranking system a little bit? And what rank did you achieve? Sure. So, okay. So he, he considered himself the comforter, right? So he's a figure prophesied in the Bible. Um, now, just a little fun fact. Before that, they had a man that they called the reincarnation of King David. Um, so they always kind of had some like one figure that was was directly connected to the spirit or to God. So that's that was the purpose of having that title of the comforter. But he was also an apostle, which was the rank. You, uh, other There were other apostles with the same rank as him, but he was over them because he was getting information directly from God, supposedly. Um, now, under the apostles, you had the 42, which were the apostles 42 men and these men were used for um the website for building web the website for driving uh, the apostles around i mean i i really don't know the extent of what they uh what they would do but it definitely involved like personal things with the apostles you know dealing with their personal lives and things like that then you had chief priests, um, which sounds very similar to the Mormon doctrine who have chief priests. So they have chief priests um, who are under the 42, and they usually would be the head of, of an entire church. So, um, or, or the, I'm sorry, of, the, of an entire city. And within the city, you'll have a church which would have a bishop over that church. So that's how it was. It was apostles, 42 chief priests, bishops. Under the bishops were generals. So generals were head of units within the church. Um, <clears throat> if there weren't enough generals, like in Orlando, uh, the rank under that was a captain, which is what I was. So I was a captain who was a head of a unit because there just wasn't enough. There weren't enough generals. And then under the captain were the officers. You have you have the two different types of captains. I was the highest captain. And then with amongst the officers, you have uh, two different types of officers. And then under the officers, you have the recruits in the Hebrew Academy who are just you know coming in, joining pretty much. So yeah, that's the structure. Carmen. No, Rivka, Rivka, go ahead. So, as you said before, these are all men that can achieve these ranks. Yes. And the women 
at some point later on are allowed to have play minor roles but not preach their job is mostly what just to obey and have babies pretty much pretty much um this it wasn't this wasn't implemented until just just around the time when i was when i was i was actually put out of the church but um that's because i was just so disenchanted with it that you know they were like man this guy he just doesn't he's dropping the ball on everything so they put me out because of that i put myself out really um it was around that time when i left that they started um well first there were two holy women which um were two young girls that were underage that were living with the cult leader um he actually got custody of these girls because they were they were too young and they still had to go to school so he had them living with them and i found this out through the mother of the of um the children that i'm sorry the wife of the cult leader pretty much um she was the one that you know they they're polygamists so you can have multiple wives and um she was the one that that blew the whistle on that that this guy had young girls living with him and he had so much time i mean months years actually with them while they were underage that he would supposedly you know spend personal time counseling them so it started out with those two holy women and then the order of the women was actually called the elect ladies which my cousin is one of them um but they're they're they don't really have any rank um when we would have our councils every month all the men all the ranks would have uh the ranking I forget, the rank is like a ranking ceremony. I forget exact, exactly what they call it. It's like a high council. Um, the women weren't allowed to come at that um, during when I when I had my rank, but later on, I guess they were allowed to start coming to these um, these meetings, and they could sit there now and listen with everybody else. I mean, they really they really didn't have any power. So, I mean, that that's really they can make some suggestions. Was what I heard, but I, I wasn't there during that time. But that, that's as far as I know with the elect ladies. Oh, Rivka, you're muted. Mm-hmm. I listened to several also videos or watched some videos of people speaking in different cities on the street. And there was an incident where a woman was trying to talk to them. And they basically just said, look, you're a woman. You're not allowed to speak to us. Where's your husband? If you we have a discussion, go get your husband or your father, you know. And then there was an aside, you know, this is the problem. These women come up here with their ideas. And so it was real, very, not just misogynist in practice, like sex segregation and women aren't allowed to hold, but overtly and, you know, um, misogynist and almost like contemptuous of, of women I, I from at least this this group but I um I wanted to ask you we're talking about so child marriage though is so that apparently is practice and then I noticed that Susanna had written something about sex slavery is that some sort of yeah. aberration that happened when all those murders happen or with specific leaders or is that something that they advocate as a, you know, because there were sex slaves in the Bible or I, you know, I'm just curious as to, because I mean, that's just, some of this stuff's really funky, but that's just really getting into crazy, even more crazy territory, like Daesh, Daesh crazy territory. Right. Well, um, they, they don't, they won't say it. They won't, they won't, announced that they believe that you can marry women you know underage girls um they they do secretly believe that but they say kind of grudgingly like well you know because we're in this kingdom and the laws of the land we can't do certain things so it's not really that that they're against it it's just that you know the laws of the land forbid them from from practicing what they want to practice the group that I was a part of started become, started toning it down a lot, a lot more than, than these, these other groups that are still very similar to how they all were in the 90s. The leader, Tazadakia, the leader of the group that I was a part of, realized that, 
They, you know, we have to tone it down a little bit. We can't look like the KKK, which is funny because he was actually on the Jerry Springer show um, um, when he had uh, Jerry Springer had black Hebrew Israelites with the KKK once. Uh, oh the, my gosh, it was a shit show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tazadakia was there, very young, very passionate. Um, this was before, I, I believe Tazadakia eventually became an atheist. I, be, I really believe he did. And um, I, I have friends that knew, that knew, that were really close to him before he got really high up and started calling himself the comforter. He had gotten some money from somewhere. I don't know who gave him a check, but somebody wrote, like, bought off the church or something. I, and there was a lot of talks of Jesuits and different people that would come and constantly try to buy off. And I don't know. I really don't know what to believe, but it's just very hard for me to believe that this guy kind of rose up to that position and got that type of, of, of fame, you know, within the community on his own without somebody in his ear. It's just... It's just very odd what happened within that group. But, um, but yeah, they, they, I mean, when it comes to uh, polygamy, they'll tell you, yeah, we practice polygamy. There's nothing wrong with it. It's in the Bible. When it comes to underage girls, they tell you we're against it. But behind the scenes, they do it. Um, GMS will tell you that we can't do it right now, but it's going to happen in the kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes or whatever during the thousand years when they're just going to um, be able to enjoy the flesh is what they say. That, that God is going to give them a thousand years on the earth so they can enjoy the flesh and, and the riches and then move on after the thousand years to just the spiritual body of some sort with the father in, in heaven. You know, but yeah, they, they it's like. They grudgingly follow these laws of the land. Um, as far as like the sex slaves, that's something that they look forward to. They don't really teach that, especially if it's one of your of your own, of you know, an Israelite um, woman. Um, they don't promote that. That's a, that's considered a princess. Like like if you read in the Bible, it says King Solomon had seven hundred uh, princesses, right, uh, which are supposed to be the Israelite wives. And 300 concubines, so a concubine or a sex slave would be a wife of another nation that you, doesn't have the privileges of, of an Israelite. Um, but there was a, uh, someone I brought into the church, this, this girl who, I mean, she, was, she wasn't underage, but she was being treated like a sex slave by the cult leader. And I actually brought her in, and she disappeared for years. I didn't get back in contact with her uh, until maybe like six years later, having heard a word from her. And she told me everything that he did to her. I did an interview with her on my channel. It was crazy. The stories were crazy. This guy would throw coins at her face. He would just literally like play mind games with her. He would tell her to be completely still. Don't move at all because I see a demon behind you. And... This would put fear in that person, and then he'll do like a loud noise and slam his phone down, which would cause, you know, uh, her to get startled. So I, I don't know what kind of um, mind control that was, but he was definitely doing some real strange things behind closed doors. So just to, just a reminder that um, the link to your uh to uh, Miguel's channel is in the description if you want to go see these interviews. Um, I, I Also, I just want to say that I don't, um, just to be clear, that I don't think there's anything wrong with polygamy as long as women get to do the same thing. Okay. Um, yeah. So just, uh, j but uh, my question is, what do you think about, um, you know, when it comes to cults and religions, there's the stated goal or the long-term goal that they, they say that they're looking forward to. But then there's also the actual goals, or the pragmatic goals, or the short-term goals, right? I don't know, maybe they're interchangeable um, or not. But what do you think they're actually trying to achieve? Like, what are they trying to get now? Um, so, one thing that Tazadakia 
you know, before he died, I don't know if that's something I should throw out there. He he is dead from the coronavirus. Um, before he died, he would always promote um, pretty much that we were going to spread like like a must, you know, like a mustard seed. And there were going to be Israelites everywhere. And you're going to see them as news anchors. You're going to see them in the, on the basketball court, on TV, as NBA players. And that they were just all going to join him, that the, that the church was going to become a nation. And then this was going to pretty much spark the second coming of Jesus Christ. We have to get a certain amount of believers. You know, if you read the book of Revelation, it's 144,000. You have 12,000 of each tribe. And once we, the thing was, once we get those 144,000, that that's going to be the governing body of the nation of Israel that will take over the whole world. And we were to rule Jeru um, the world from Jerusalem. Um, we were going to take that land somehow, um, you know, with spiritual powers, I guess. And, and you know, we were going to be set in power and rule the, everyone. You know, everyone was going to be subject to the Israelites, to the blacks, Hispanics and Native Americans. And we're going to be in the land of Israel, ruling from there, with Jesus Christ there, by the way, um, when he comes for a thousand years. Um, and, I mean, they they literally believe that this is like around the corner. You know, they, they believe it's, it's, but there's so many different groups. It's like you have to add them all up to get, you know, a few hundred thousand of them. They're not all together. So um, you have the, the biggest group would be, I would say there's two different groups. Um, GOCC, -G which is the Gathering of Christ Church, they are, they actually are not as, as extreme. They allow white people in, um, but they have a lot of the same teachings. And I know they have like, I think 90,000 subscribers on their main channel on YouTube. Um, then you have Israel United in Christ, or IUIC, which they, they wear the all purple. And they, I think two years ago, they marched in Memphis down the street and in the streets of Memphis and closed down like downtown Memphis. And there were about 800 of them, just non, I mean, just a sea of purple down, you know, for blocks. I don't know how many of them there were, but um, I saw that, that Jill Scott, the singer, she posted that video recently but that, that video is years old and she posted it on her instagram and it got a lot of views i think that they have anywhere from like twenty thousand to forty thousand believers you know it's hard to tell because some people just are like like you know like i was saying before uh high holy day israelites or youtube followers you know um so they're not all dedicated members that actually pay tithes but, um, they, I mean, there's a lot of them. And, I mean, you have basketball players, like I mentioned, Boys to Men, uh, the singers. Um, you have basketball players like Carmelo Anthony, uh, who recently spoke about 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. You have Amari Stoudemire, um, who's another a basketball player. I don't think he plays anymore, but he definitely uh, has been seen wearing, you know, Hebrew Israelite shirts. Lamar Odom, another one. Uh, who has been uh, seen wearing some type of gear. Um, and I think even 21 Savage has said a few things in his lyrics. Kendrick Lamar has said some things in his music. Um, in my time, it was Nas that would talk about the Israelites. I'm a big, very big Nas fan. I grew up listening to him. And so I would hear that in the music. You know, you, it's, it's there. You'll hear it like here and there. And then Wu-Tang... Um, you saw also talk about some of this Hebrew Israelite stuff like Riza and Killer Priest. Um, they actually came, a few of them actually came to one of the Passovers that that they had in the 90s before I joined. Um, some of the Wu-Tang members actually came by. So, um, I mean, they really believe that they're going to take over the earth. And, um, you know, it's just about gaining more membership and slowly creep into politics and just every faction of, of life. And. And, and take over that way. So, 
similarly to a lot of other ideologically extreme groups who also believe that, you know, the world's end of the world's coming or the, you know, Mashiach is coming and then, you know, there it's going to be their time. Um, at, like a lot of them will actively oh. try to, to bring up you know, terrorist acts or, you know, changing laws. Oh, Rivka, you cut out. Can you say that again? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. A lot of these groups will actively do things to try and bring on this, you know, this thing they want to happen. So I'm curious. I know that there's been a spate of violence, particularly in New York, against overtly looking Jews. Do you think some of that trying to bring this on or other, you know, really aggressive techniques? And then, of course, there were these murders that happened in Philadelphia that, uh, you know, against other members. I just was wondering if you had heard or do you know if that's part of some maybe other camps, you know, not just believing this, but actually doing things to sort of bring it forward. OK, um, well, I I've never heard any group. I think the groups are the ones that keep the people in, in order and they and they tell them, you know, this is not the time. So um, they, they don't promote that. They really don't. I mean, as, as they they can encourage it. They'll, they'll encourage it by just um, their hatred. You know, it, it's it's not I mean, I'm sorry, it's not encouraged to actually do it. But just just the 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 way that they speak will, you know, if somebody comes in there, that's not that's not all there, you know, that can really, really radicalize them. So like you had in Jersey with the, the, that shooter, I forget his name. I did a video on that too. Um, but he was part of the black Hebrew Israelites and he shot up a, a, a Jewish market in union union city. Um, so he had actually attended the classes at, at the, the cult that I was a part of a few times just prior to him shooting up that that um that market so um it's not something that they promote they want to stay away from that and especially the cult that i was a part of that the icgjc the leader was um he wanted to keep it as quiet as possible like he he wanted to bring in the members but he didn't want to bring a lot of attention to himself because you know he was uh, he was doing a lot of un illegal things like he he was arrested for tax fraud you know, he got he actually pled guilty uh, to, to tax fraud and um, to six count, five counts of tax fraud and conspiracy to defraud the United States. Um, he had a, a lawyer, uh, Gerald Lefcourt, who was a lawyer for Jeffrey Epstein back in 2008, um, helped him get um, only 18 months um uh, for this tax, uh, these tax, what was it, uh, conspiracy to commit fraud. That was the one charge he pled guilty to. And he only got 18 months, just like Epstein got in 2008. And um, before he even went to jail, they gave him like 90 days to, surren to surrender. To surrender, I've never heard of such a thing. But, you know, when you have a, a lawyer like Gerald Lefcourt, I guess you could get away with a lot of things. And, um, but when it was time for him to turn himself in, he contracted the um, coronavirus and actually died uh, a week and a half after contracting the virus. So they, they had pushed the date back to August to, for them to surrender. It was actually two guys that got, that got convicted. Um, so the, the main leader, he, he didn't, you know, he didn't make it. He passed away. He already had, he had diabetes. So that coronavirus really affected him. But, you know, before he died, he was he was like really just trying to keep it quiet because, I mean, it was it was like a, a pyramid scheme where we were the ones that were going out there teaching others. He wasn't he would he wouldn't go out there and teach. He wouldn't debate. You couldn't ask him any questions. He didn't do any live chats. It was all very secretive. If you wanted to talk to him, you had to come inside of the church. They have security outside of the church that pat you down and make sure that you don't have anything on you. So every time we would go, come to class, even with my rank, I would still be patted down. You know, 
after years of me being a faithful member and paying all this money, they they pat you down no matter what. I mean, you could be there for 20 years or just the first day there. One last question. Have you found since you've left and you've been vocal, have you found other people who have left the Hebrew Israelites that you're now, you know, in contact with and being supportive? Because I think that that's really helpful to a lot of people when they're leaving, you know, really um, mm. restrictive ideological positions is to have that support. Oh, yeah, definitely. That was the reason why I created the channel. That was the only reason I, I like you said, it's it's very frustrating. And it's like you, you feel like after you go back and forth, like you feel dizzy almost like they put you in a trance just listening to them. And uh, as many times as I wanted to stop and not <laughs> make any videos, I always get someone that messages me and tells me, I, you know, I've listened to your videos. Thank you. You know, many people have, have contacted me and told me that I helped them see the way out, um, that maybe they got put out. You know, I didn't help them leave the church, but they got put out. And then watching my videos just kind of helped them realize that, you know, it's th that they're going to be OK because they need to see people that denounce the church that are doing OK, that are doing good, because the way that they talk about ex-members is that, oh, they're 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 going through hell. They're you know, they're catching hell. I heard this and I heard that they'll invent all types of stories about ex-members. I'm sorry. They'll there you are. <laughs> Uh, they'll invent all types of stories against ex-members to try to make them look like they're just going through a horrible time because they left the church, you know. So I, there was a lot of stories about myself that I started hearing. People would tell me, I mean, they said I was a cop. They said I turned feds. They said that uh, I was homeless. They said that I was a drug addict. I mean, I've heard so many different things. And, um, you know, I, <laughs> I mean, it's just hilarious that, that they would, uh, you know, say these things. And it, it, that's what made me realize that this thing is definitely a farce. It's definitely a cult. Um, that's like the first thing that made me realize that what I'm doing is, is right because they started lying about me. That's when I knew, OK, they're lying about me. This is definitely a cult. This is definitely something's wrong. Because even as I was as I was um, kind of leaving the cult, I still had that fear, you know, that maybe this thing is true. Maybe I'm going to go to hell. You know, maybe I need to come back. There's a lot of people that leave the cult and they relapse. <laughs> you know, they come back. They they There's so much fear that was put into us that we can't function, you know, we, 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 we're paranoid. And I, I, I've recently spoken to some people that, I mean, now that this guy is dead, they're like really seeing it. You know, people are waking up more and more and, you know, they'll contact me and I can tell that they'll, they're still there at that point where they're kind of like on the fence, but they're brave enough to speak to me. Like they, they got rid of that fear. Because they're so scared to even speak to any ex-member for fear of being uh, exposed or and called, you know, and called a rebel or an antichrist, which is what they call me. They call everybody when they leave, pretty much. That's pretty badass, though. Well, I mean, I just want to encourage you to keep doing your work. I think it's so important because I also think about maybe some kid that they meet on the street and they're trying to talk into this or in a full grown adult um, who and they're like, go do the research, go see what they what we have to say. It's true. And they immediately are directed towards their materials, right? Their yeah. idea of what's true. But you're out there, one of the few people openly countering it. So I'm thinking about how many people you probably helped not even get involved in the first place. Right. Because when they're doing their searches, they can find here's someone walking through all the logical fallacies that they employ to entrap people who are convinced by this right and so i think you're doing absolutely awesome work yeah thank you thank you very much armin do you have any more questions 
No, can you just uh, one more time, like, tell people where they can find you and follow you, um, just for the people that um, maybe not. And again, all of this is going to be in the description. I just want to make it because I, I like Susanna said, I think your the work you're doing is so valuable, and you de you deserve a bigger following. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So so you can find me right right here on YouTube, uh, San Miguel TV. There's a few San Miguel TVs. Mine is the one with the actual TV as the thumbnail. Um, and I'm also on Instagram at San Mig underscore. And yeah, you can contact me there. If you, you know, you can reach out to me if you have any questions. And uh, I have tons of videos. You know, I have interviews with actual Israelites. I'm still friends with a lot of Hebrew Israelites that um you know I, I we just don't talk about it you know they watch my videos they know where i stand um they're not as extreme they don't believe what they used to believe when we were together in the cult but they've kind of moved on to a less extreme more progressive type of hebrew israelite belief that is more inclusive and i, I think you know i think i've helped them with that because they see that you know i can get along with Israelites, even if I don't believe in it anymore. So, yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I hope. Can we have you back? I have, Definitely. like, so much I need to talk to you about, but oh, we've already yeah. taken so much of your time. Rivka? Yeah. One last thing I wanted to bring up since you were talking about having friends that are still in the Israelites, and you had mentioned that you had friends while you were involved with the cult, but you just didn't tell them about it. And I found that really interesting. Like, do you think that that was uh, at all part of why you were able to question this or why you were able to leave or because you were in contact with people that weren't only in that circle? Right. And right. so I feel like you being able to talk to them that are still there is really beneficial because now they're in contact with someone who's not only in you know right just not I, that close circle I, I do think that because I mean I really I, I, I was supposed to believe that the white man was the devil but my friends were not the devil and I knew that and I, I didn't want to be you know I, I didn't want to come into conflict with my beliefs so I was just like you know what I'm gonna shut up about it um, and we're gonna still hang out and be friends and and yeah it was kind of like um, you know, something that I, I held on to where I wasn't fully in, in like, like involved. I mean, I was, I was completely in there in the cult, but there was always certain things that always stuck out that wasn't right. And, and having those friends was, was, was definitely one of those things. That's so good. And I think it's important that you are friends with people who are actively still in it because you're going to be a strong connection. When you're a model, you're proving to them it is physical evidence that you leaving will not result in death, drug addiction, homelessness, right? So that's a contradiction to their belief. You're not possessed. You're not controlled by Satan, you know? So that's a contradiction. And you're modeling to them that there is a way out and you're being a friendly listening ear. So you're just awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording here. Um, okay.